Hello, readers. Justin Gregg is an animal behavior and cognition expert specializing in dolphins at St. Francis Xavier University and the author of If Nietzsche Were a Narwhal, What Animal Intelligence Reveals About Human Stupidity. Justin, thank you for the time. How are you doing today? I am great. How are you doing? I'm doing very well, thank you. So what was your goal with this book? Uh, the goal was to get people to rethink their relationship to animals, uh, but by rethinking the nature of human intelligence. Because when we look at animals, we're kind of always like, ah, that one's behaving like a person that seems kind of smart. And so we, we think they're more interesting or worthy of study um, because the underlying assumption is that human intelligence, our kind of intelligence is a cool, interesting, good thing. And so if we find it in an animal, that makes them cool. But the whole book is about like, well, are we so sure that human intelligence is all that great? Um, because it produces a lot of bad stuff along with good stuff. So that was the goal of the book, to get people to sort of flip the script on intelligence. And why Nietzsche? Uh, well, you know, he's a troubled figure. He went through a lot of, you know, I didn't know that much about Nietzsche really, but I did know the thing that everyone kind of knows, like he was sort of a depressed guy, uh, stuck on nihilism and he was great because he had written about animals specifically and he wrote about envying animals because they weren't that smart and couldn't think about things deeply and so he's like ah oh, they must be leading happier lives because they're not smart and so I'm like well that's a perfect jumping off point for the book so I went more into his ideas about that concept and finally before we get into some of the details of the book why the narwhal uh, well, I mean, I study marine mammals, um, and Narwhal alliterates with Nietzsche, so that's perfect uh, for a, a book title. But um, but no, I've written about narwhals before. I just think they're mysterious and interesting, and they're the sort of perfect foil for Nietzsche, in a sense, because they're swimming around in the ocean doing their narwhal things, and then the question is, are they happy? Are they doing well, uh, despite not having human-like intelligence? So I just had to pick an animal to pit against Nietzsche. <laughs> and narwhals are great. I just love the idea. I kept picturing Nietzsche with a narwhal horn sticking out of his head. And then that ended up on the book cover. I'm like, that's, I don't know. It just it was perfect. Yeah, I love how that is uh, the actual uniform uh, unicorn in the animal world also. And I think that uh, just if you're going deeper with the levels of everything, I think it does make a lot of sense. So kudos on that one. Now, chapter one <laughs> is the why specialists. It is essentially about humans propensity to ask the question why and it helping us to advance in a sense and accomplish much of what we have been able to accomplish over the last 44,000 plus years. And you do actually go back to the origins of us asking why. How do we know that it was around 44,000 years ago? And what were they asking about back then? Uh, that's a good question. The, the evidence of what humans were thinking is difficult because to find because it all happens in our skulls. So you have to look at the things we produce. And so once agriculture pops into existence, then we're like, okay, well, humans must have been asking questions about how how plants grow, how the world works, how to store things for the winter. So you know that they're thinking more deeply about how the world works. So you can pinpoint for sure um, at that point. You also have things like uh, making fire. Um, that's an example of it. That's a little bit older. Not just humans had been doing that. Uh, other hominid species as well. So you're just looking for ar archaeological evidence of humans asking why. And I mentioned a couple of things in the book, including the art the artwork, including artwork of humanoid figures with animal heads, which is symbolic. Uh, and once you find symbolic artwork like that, you can guess that humans are asking why questions about life and death, um, and specifically why we die and what death is. And once that's happening, you know for sure that those why questions are rattling around in our skulls. How much of a biological advantage have humans gained from our propensity for asking why? Well, that that question in particular, that's why I singled it out in the first chapter, is really the catalyst for everything that humans do. Why anything happens. That, you know, science is just asking why, cause and effect. What makes something else happen? What is the cause? Uh, and that leads to technological advancements, you know, the invention of vaccines. Pretty much everything you see around us is from 
you know, tens of thousands of years of human culture trying to figure out why things happen. So it is at the really at the core of human intelligence. And so all of the advantages like medicine, for example, uh, are thanks to that question. And I'm glad you brought up medicine because the why question, while it oftentimes does help us make incredible new discoveries, it can also lead to wrong answers that lead to uh, years, if not centuries of suffering. How do ancient and medieval medicine show that the why question can do more harm than good? Yeah, I, I talk about humorism in the book, uh, and that was the sort of dominant medical paradigm in Western Europe for hundreds of, if not thousands of years, uh, based on the imbalances in the humor cause in the humors in the body causing disease. And at the base core of that system, everything was wrong. Uh, so a lot of their guesses as to why, how you could cure people uh, were creating bonkers solutions that really don't make any sense and didn't necessarily work all that well. So it wasn't always causing harm. And sometimes it did work. But for the most part, it's a whole system that's based on nonsense, let's say. Uh, and it's not just ancient humans, because like I mentioned in the book, like uh, ulcers, you know, we thought ulcers were caused by stress. Like when I was a kid, Ulcers were caused by stress, we thought. And then only very recently did we learn, actually, no, they're caused by a bacteria. So we've been treating ulcers wrong very recently for, for decades. So ultimately, of course, you keep building on your experience and you find out why things really happen. Uh, and then you get better and better medicine. So it's not always necessarily harmful, but it's a lot of the time it's useless. What is associative learning, Justin, and how did this concept play out with an experiment that compared experienced radiologists versus pigeons <laughs> with identifying breast cancer? Yeah, so that's, I love that example. So associative learning is how most animals, including humans, do anything. Like when one thing happens, you associate it with another thing. Like when you see lightning, uh, you know that thunder will follow. So those two things are associated. And you don't know why thunder happens. You don't need to. So in this experiment, you scientists were able to train pigeons who have very sharp visual acuity uh, to recognize the difference between cancerous tissue in the lungs and healthy tissue. So that's just the way that the cancer tissue looks like. So they can learn to categorize uh, between the two. So they don't understand what they're looking at in a deep sense. You know, They can just make a very quick association between cancerous tissue, not cancerous tissue, and then you test them against radiologists by having them look at x-rays or uh, of tissue and you find oh actually the uh, the pigeons are better than your than the average radiologist and um, that's simply just because of a very basic form of learned association which i think is hilarious <laughs> to me yes, and is. that's why you can train an ai for example to recognize things just as easily hmm. Chapter two is to be honest. This chapter is all about deception. Now, animals do deceive, often for the sake of survival, but there are examples of otherwise as well. How do cuttlefish, like sadly too many humans, occasionally deceive for the sake of sex? Yeah, so much deception is based on sex, it's true. Uh, but the cuttlefish example is really great. It's a form of deception called tactical deception. Uh, and that's a kind of deception where it seems as if the animal really does mean to deceive. It's not just an a accidental byproduct. So in this case, male cuttlefish um, want to mate with females, and it's usually the larger cuttlefish that has dibs. So if you're a smaller cuttlefish, you will position yourself, if you want to mate with a female, between the large male and the female. And on one half of the cuttlefish's body, they have the ability to control the pigmentation to show different um, coloration patterns that are a form of communication so it'll show the female uh the male side uh, of the coloration of being a male so it's like i'm a big beautiful man and on the other side where the big male can see them they're showing the pattern of a female so from the perspective of the larger cuttlefish it looks as if he's looking at two females so he's the the subordinate the smaller one is fooling them in the meantime the smaller guy is wooing the female without the big guy knowing uh and so that it seems to be that the, the smaller male is doing that on purpose to fool the big male to not get in trouble for wooing the female. Uh, so there you go. That's a great example of tactical deception, but that's relatively rare in the animal kingdom. Humans do that, as you point out, incessantly. That's what going to a bar is all about, you know, trying to put your best foot forward and uh, appeal to the ladies or the guys, you know. 
That and your average dating app too. So what is so unique about how humans lie, Justin? Um, well, what's interesting about human lying is we have a couple things animals don't have, language being one of them. Like all of these words coming out of my mouth are, are to change the ideas in your head. That's what language is designed to do. So uh, if I can do that with words, then of course I can put false information into your head. And we have something called theory of mind, which is our ability to understand or to guess what other people are thinking. Humans are all about guessing what other humans are doing and trying to interact with them and manipulate their behavior. Uh, so if I can guess that you believe something, um, then I can use words to make you try and believe something that's not true. And that's good for me because I can, like if I was a car salesman and, and you know, and I thought you might like sports cars, um, I can be like, great. And over, well, over and I bring you over to some sports car and tell you how beautiful and amazing it is. So that's me guessing what you like and then manipulating you. So that's how humans operate all the time. As you know, on dating apps, for example, it's all about lying and try to get people to do what you want. Uh, animals, because they don't have theory of mind and they don't have language, they don't do that as often. Is there any evidence that some animals have a semblance of theory of the mind or is that a pretty uniquely human concept as well? There definitely is evidence. Uh, it's a hotly debated topic in the field because there's evidence that animals like chimpanzees would have it, uh, some of the corvids like crows and ravens, uh, animals we traditionally think of as socially complex uh, and intelligent seem to have evidence of theory of mind to some extent. Uh, but even that evidence some is challenged by others. So yes, animals probably have it, but certainly not to the extent that we know that humans, it's it's just part and parcel of being a human. Everything that we do, all of our behavior has to be, you need theory of mind to explain it, but not so much in a chimpanzee's world. What is the difference between lying and bullshitting? Ah, <laughs> bullshit. Okay, this is an interesting one, especially in the current political climate or any political climate, really. Uh, lying is, be is me knowing what's true and guessing what you believe and trying to put false information out there uh, for personal game. Bullshitting is just saying a bunch of random things and I don't really know if they're true or not and I don't really care that's not the point. I'm just trying to sow confusion in the world. So that's uh, uh, bullshitting. Chapter three is death wisdom. It is all about our understanding and obsession with death. Now you cite some examples of animals exhibiting grief while also writing that grief is not synonymous with an understanding of death. What do you mean by that? Yeah, there are uh, people who study this will try and differentiate between the two. So it, an, an animal can grieve like my chickens, for example, if one of the other chickens is dead, they might have some idea that that chicken is no longer going to do the things it used to do and they will miss it they will be sad about that they you know they can't sit next to each other on the on the roost anymore and so they might have emotions and feelings of of grief over the fact that, that chicken is no longer around to do stuff but that doesn't necessarily mean they understand all of the components of death they understand that they they themselves will die one day that death is inevitable and in, inescapable um, and how it works. And they're not asking questions about this eternal soul, et cetera. So you can still grieve for something, uh, even though you don't understand exactly what death is and all the implications. What is episodic foresight as an important concept to understand with this subject? Hmm. Hold on. <coughs> not COVID, don't worry. <coughs> not that you can get it through the screen anyway. <laughs> yeah, so episodic foresight is your ability to take your concept of yourself, so you, Trey, can be like, oh, I wonder what I'm going to do next week or the week after. So you can envision yourself going to the movies or going to a football game. Um, and that allows you to also envision lots of future scenarios, like you're at a football game and you're in the top of the stands and then you fall off into the parking uh, area and die. That's a thing you can imagine happening. Uh, that's what episodic foresight can do. Now, animals <clears throat> can do that to some extent. They can put themselves a little bit in the future, but not that far. And certainly not to the point where they can envision themselves in all these terribly dangerous scenarios where they might die. So it turns out that there is some scientific truth to the idea of an internal clock. I didn't realize this until reading your book. What do our cells have to do with the, this concept through something called transcription translation feedback? Yeah, that, I mean, that's not something I 
personally study and know a lot about. So I had to ask people um, how that works. But essentially, all cells evolve with the ability to mark the passage of time. Uh, and they finally figured out how that works with the production uh, of proteins that shuts off halfway through the day and then starts up again. And they found that that whole cycle happens to be exactly or almost 24 hours. And so that means that essentially all life is aware of the passage of, of time as it relates to the sun, which makes sense if you think about it, because every all the plants out there are based, their whole lives are based on the sun. Our lives are based on the sun because we, you know, we see things during the day and not at night. So all of humanity is about going to bed at night and sleeping and staying protected. So pretty much any animal or plant, except for ones living in caves, are concerned with the sun. And so all life really evolved to mark the passage of time as it relates to the sun at the cellular level. Evolutionary, uh, evolutionary thanatology has to do with gaining a better sense of how our psychological understanding and responses to death have evolved over time. What is this field of study uncovered about how non-human species respond to death, Justin? Yeah, a lot of that is also based on the grief and the grieving issue. Uh, and so how animals respond uh, to how other one an animal in their social group dies. And, and some of that also has to do with what they really do understand about death. And there's, there's a philosopher, uh, Susanna Monceau, who, who writes about this quite a bit. Uh, and you have this idea of the minimal concept of death. So at the basic level, any animal might be able to categorize the world between living and dead things. After coming across a dead friend for the first time, they'll suddenly they'll know something about what it means to be dead. They know that that animal won't get up and walk around again. So that's at the at the bare minimum. But then humans, of course, we evolved this deep, deep understanding of what death is. So the question is, how did that come about? And how is that different to how an elephant, for example, might understand death? Because elephants seem to get the concept as well. There's, they're famously you know, going back and forth to elephant graveyards and fondling the bones of long dead relatives, presumably thinking about their, their dead friends. Uh, so it's, we wanna know, of course, as humans, how did we get to this stage? And you, you can look at elephants and ask the question, what they understand about death. So humans obviously have a deeper understanding of death than uh, any other animal because of our consciousness. Now, that can lead one to become pretty miserable if they're thinking about it too much. But death has also uh, served as a sort of catalyst uh, and inspiration for invention and innovation. So do you think that humans are better or worse off with, uh, with having this deeper grasp on death? So that is the million dollar question. And I don't necessarily know the answer. It's not, ex you know, from an evolutionary perspective, who knows? Uh, but like Nietzsche being the great example, because he was a miserable guy, because he spent most of his time worrying about nihilism, death, mortality, etc. And maybe part of that misery was caused by him worrying about it. Like he would have been a, a much more fun guy to be around if he didn't think about it all the time. Uh, so in that sense, like, is his life enhanced from this knowledge? Probably not. Like, what a bummer of a guy, you know? But like you say, at the same time, you know, death and concern for death, that produces music and poetry, and people strive to create things that will live after they are dead. And that produces all the beautiful stuff that humans do. So on balance, uh, you know, which is better? I, I have the example of my seeing my daughter for the first time understand what death is like understanding that she's going to be dead and it was heartbreaking to watch and so in the book i say look i'd i'd rather she didn't know about that i think she would be happier and i'd be happier but i but i don't know it's really up to the individual yeah how how old is your daughter justin she's 14 now 14 okay so i have a seven year old daughter and a five-year-old son and a couple of years ago my daughter who at the time would have been five who is also incredibly smart. She's a voracious reader. I don't even understand how she reads as much as he does at the age of seven, <laughs> but she's asked deep questions for the longest time now. And a couple of years ago, we were driving home from dinner and we were passing by a graveyard and she looked over at the graveyard and said, mommy, daddy, where will we go when we die? Mm. And so 
my wife and I look at one another and we start talking about different religions, believe this, not realizing that we were passing by a graveyard. And so we start to try and give her these deep answers on things. And she says, well, what if I want to go there when I die? And she just points over at the graveyard. So she was asking a very literal question about <laughs> where her body physically goes when she dies. And we're trying to give her some spiritual <laughs> answer of things too. So anyhow, kids, kids are wonderfully curious. And sometimes they uh, elicit answers from parents that weren't necessarily intended to be. That's it. I love that fantastic story. You were like a year or two too early with the sort of uh, uh, spiritual side. <laughs> yeah, the existential stuff, exactly. So chapter yeah. four is maybe my favorite chapter title. It's the gay albatross around our necks. And right. uh, this chapter has uh, has to do with a sense of morality or maybe a false sense of morality. Animals exhibit an understanding of right and wrong through a set of evolutionary norms that have settled in over hundreds of thousands of years. When and why did a sort of normative expansion among humans begin, which really started to shape our collective sense of morality? Yeah, that's a good question. It's probably around the same time uh, we popped into existence and all those other skills that I mentioned earlier in the book, like why specialism, uh, for example, or theory of mind, language. Once all that stuff starts uh, to coalesce and you start asking why, uh, then you can start asking, well, why, you know, why do people do things? What should they be doing? What is right? What is wrong? You know, then you get this discussion around your each other's behavior. Uh, and then you start developing moral systems. So that probably popped into existence, you know, somewhere between quarter of a million and 40,000 years ago, I would imagine. And, um, and yeah, asking why people do stuff and what should we be doing? Yeah, animals, like I mentioned in the book, the normative systems, you know, your dog, I don't know if you have any pets, a dog or a cat. Um, the question would be like, well, you know, my dog is a wild animal. Why doesn't it just run around biting and killing everyone all the time? What stops it? What, what, why does the, you know, the dog flip up and it's upside down and want its belly scratch and show submission toward me? Well, that's because in that dog's head are all these rules about what the dog should be doing or not doing in relationship to humans and other dogs. Uh, and it, those norms prevent it from doing some things and encourage it to do other things. And all animals work through those systems, any social species has to have a system for interacting with each other. Um, so humans have those as well. But then when you start asking about, well, why? Why do I have to show submission to this other dog? Then you end up with human style morality. And speaking of, what was the Canadian Indian residential school system and why does it make a compelling case against this supposed morality? Yeah, it's interesting because that just popped up in the news because the Pope is visiting Canada right now uh, to apologize for the residential school system. So that was um, back when not long after Canada formed, and they had these in the States as well. Uh, you had these ideas of you will take the indigenous populations uh, and you want to make them more Western uh, because Western society would be better. And that's how you, you know, have a more healthy society. So they took uh, young children from indigenous families across Canada and forced them to go to these school systems that were run mostly by uh, Christian organizations. And the idea was to stop them from practicing their culture, not speak their language, and of course, make them Christian. Uh, and so the kids would live on in these schools and sometimes not go home to see their parents for years. Uh, and they were forcibly taken from the home a lot of the time. And so that went on for 100, some 150 odd years, a long time, not until very, you know, 40 years ago, these schools shut down. Um, and the idea was like the people running them were not mean and evil people, the, the church, the government, they had this high moral uh, reasoning for it. They said, we want to help these people by making them more Western. Um, it made sense according to Christian doctrine at the time, the Catholic doctrine uh, and the government. So they thought they were doing the right thing. So they had reasoned their way into a position where they were sure they were doing the right thing. But now we look at it and we're like, well, that's a, that's terrible. Like that what they did was absolutely awful. And the, 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 you know, the Pope is over here apologizing for what he called it. He called it evil. Uh, and so they changed their thinking. And so I use that as an example because I'm like, look, we can justify pretty much any terrible behavior and call it morally correct. And, you know, the history of human civilization is us justifying doing terrible things to each other because we think we have the moral high ground, which is why I'm like, well, not it's not that everything is relative. 
Um, but, but certainly through the history of our species, we do a lot of bad things by claiming moral authority. Yeah, sadly, that's not the uh, only example of colonism uh, having such a negative impact on indigenous peoples either. Now, plenty of other non-human species exhibit homosexual behavior, as uh, you do touch on this topic, as the title yeah. of the chapter would suggest. Have we learned anything about what's happening neurologically with gay animals? And are these creatures ever ostracized by their species, like what happens with humans? Yeah, well, that's why I love that example, because uh, uh, same-sex behavior, homosexual behavior in the animal kingdom is common. Uh, there will always be a percentage of pretty much any species we've looked at that engages in, in same-sex behavior, either exclusively sometimes or just randomly, like bonobos being a great example. Uh, and the part, as you point out, that I'm the point I make in the book is like, in none of those societies is that ever punished. There literally aren't any examples of like two you know, two same-sex bonobos doing something and then another bonobo going in and being like, cut that out, you know? Nobody has a problem with it in the animal kingdom. Only humans do. Uh, and so that's why I make the point. I'm like, well, something that's so widespread, so normal in non-human animal species, we've turned into a huge problem. For some reason, a lot of cultures historically and currently have a problem with same-sex anything and get really bent out of shape about it. And I just say, well, that's us having again reasoned ourselves ourselves into a moral position which creates pain and suffering and awfulness toward uh, uh gay people everywhere and uh for no real reason other than we've thought our way into creating the misery and i looked at animals and i'm like why couldn't we be more like them and just everybody chill it's totally normal yeah, that's a, that's a great question to ask for sure. Now, one other thing that you write about in this chapter is that outside of humans, the best example of horrific same species violence is found in chimpanzees. But I've seen research that suggests that on average, humans aren't even close to the most murderous creatures on the planet. That, for some reason, uh, belongs to the meerkat. Crows, obviously, sexually assault uh, other dead crows after mourning them. Dolphins and penguins, as you're well of uh, the former because you're an expert on dolphins, they will murder and rape. Plenty of creatures do partake in infanticide as well. So what makes how humans do these things so much more heinous, Justin? Um. There, there are certainly examples of uh, violence. Chimpanzees are notoriously uh, uh, violent as well. Humans, it's true, uh, most of the time aren't murdering each other. Uh, like, you know, we can go to the store and, and shop for a while and not murder other people in line to get their popcorn. And whereas an animal might more, more likely do that with someone in the same species. Um, so yes, on one hand, we're certainly not as violent as chimpanzees. But on the other hand, what we have produced as a society is one that can wage war uh, on each other, war uh, mechanized ways of destroying each other, justifications for bombing cities with children in them, uh, murder, rape, uh, that is part of human conflict as well. But when we do it, we do it on such an indiscriminately large scale that it just seems really quite terrible. You, you don't see a chimpanzee group with another group that will go in and murder every single chimpanzee in that other group, including the infants. They don't do that. Most infanticide happens, but it's quite rare. Whereas in, in human society, we can justify bombing a city filled with children. Uh, and that's fine because we have the moral high ground as it were. So I think it's the scale and the technology of that makes human violence that much more repugnant feeling. It just feels grosser to me. Chapter five is the mystery of the happy bee. This chapter delves into consciousness. So what is consciousness? Uh, there's so many ways to define it. So I just had to pick a random one. So essentially it's, it's that um, the feeling that you get when you experience something. So anything. So like, uh, you know, these feelings you get of eating an apple and it tastes sweet and you, you know, the experience of the sound. Anytime your brain is experiencing something that would be that you can reflect on and think about that is consciousness and when thinking about whether animals experience a form of consciousness we can do a couple of things when uh, comparing to humans one is looking at brain structures which has been done a ton and then also paying attention to behavioral evidence so how do drunk elephants provide a sort of behavioral evidence of animal consciousness 
Yeah, the idea is when you this is a ridiculous experiment from a while ago you give elephants a bunch of different water with different alcohol content in it and you will find that they uh, are drawn to one where they can drink a fair amount and then get buzzed so not drink a bunch and then pass out uh, and certain not drink water they prefer a little bit of alcohol like we do in a wine or a beer uh, to get slightly buzzed and so then the question is well if an animal is seeking out a mind-altering substance it must mean that they have some mind to alter and are aware of the nice feelings. Otherwise, why do it at all? Uh, so that's, it's a really basic argument for animals that seek out pleasure and avoid pain or do anything probably means they are reflecting on their pleasure and pain to some extent, especially if it's just a recreational thing like alcohol. So it's, it's basic, but pretty solid evidence, I think, for, for some sort of self-awareness. And why is a New Zealand parrot named Bruce another good example of animal <laughs> consciousness? Yeah, Bruce the parrot is, is an interesting example because he lost half of his beak in, in the wild uh, and they rescued him and researchers uh, observed him and noticed that uh, he was unable to preen himself. That's where you clean your feathers by dragging it between your two halves of your beak um, because he was missing a beak. So what he was doing was grabbing a rock and holding it between his tongue and his lower beak and, and using the rock to preen his feathers. And it's an example of tool use in animals, which is interesting, but Bruce was doing it very methodically in that he was looking for exactly the right rock. So it would take some time going around his enclosure, looking for the perfect rock that fit perfectly, and he would position it ever so perfectly, and then sometimes drop it and go retrieve it. And so the preciseness with which he was solving this problem and looking for a solution really only happens if we know that Bruce has an idea of the problem, the nature of the problem, and an idea for the solution and is thinking about it and, and grabbing the right rock. So it wasn't just trial and error. Uh, and it wasn't just, uh, as people used to think, uh, animals were just sort of robotic machines, just pre-programmed to do stuff like it. He was doing some complicated problem solving. So he's just a great example of one animal that seems to be aware of what he's doing and why. Why is human consciousness so special, Justin? Well, what's interesting about human consciousness is that we seem to be aware of, like Bruce was aware of the problem and the solutions, but we're aware of so many other things going on in our minds. Uh, yes, how we're feeling or whatever, but, but we can also be aware of, like you mentioned before, episodic foresight. We're aware of ourselves moving through time, back in time and forward in time. So, um, it's not the case that animals are not conscious and that humans are, or that we're more conscious. The consciousness is just simply being aware of anything, and most animals are. But what humans have is to be aware of more things, more of our thinking, our thought processes. We have more available to us to consider and think about. And that's what makes humans uh, able to do some of the things we do, just more more thoughts in our head that we're aware of. I mean, of course, you know, there's a ton of things going on subconsciously that we don't, we're not aware of. Um, but humans are lucky that we can, we're aware of more. And one thing that humans may specialize in is metacognition, which is the ability to be conscious of your own thinking, but it also may not be unique, uh, unique to humans. How did an experiment involving dolphins show that animals may possess a version of metacognition as well? Yeah, metacognition is, is neat. It's about thinking about your own thinking and being aware of what you do and do not know, uh, which is interesting because like you can know that like, oh, I think I've seen that movie or no, I haven't seen that movie. So that you're aware of what you know and don't know. So this experiment with the dolphin was kind of testing that ability. Uh, so they, they simply played, um, they had an experiment where there's two kinds of tones. There was a really high tone and then there was everything else below that. And the dolphin just had to differentiate between the high tone and one of those other tones. But once the, the low tone got so close to the high tone that the dolphin was unable to tell the difference between the high and the low tone, it had the option for a third option, which was to choose the I don't know button. Uh, and they designed the experiment in such a way that choosing the I don't know button was better than choosing the wrong button. And so as soon as we know the dolphin was having trouble differentiating, she would hit the I don't know button, which it can only be done if the dolphin is aware of what it knows and what it doesn't know. It knows it's having a hard time differentiating between the tones. So that is proof uh, or very good um, 
evidence anyway of a dolphin having metacognition. Chapter six is prognostic myopia. What is prognostic myopia as exemplified by bananas? <laughs> yes, well, prognostic myopia is like as we were talking before, humans can think about the future. You know, we can you can imagine yourselves yourself 10 or 20 years down the road. But our biology, all animal biology, has an emotional response to thinking about the here and now, right? So this feeling of hunger that we have now is really important to us. And like, yes, I might be hungry in 10 years, but that doesn't, it's not as meaningful to me. So my behavior is still about the here and now. And so in the book, I talk about the banana problem, which is, you know, I'm like, I am hungry right now. And so my, I want to go get a snack. And so, you know, a million years ago, our primate relatives would have just walked over into the ground and grabbed a handful of ants and eaten them. Problem solved. But humans are smart. And so I'm like, well, I want a snack, but I want, I prefer a banana. That'd be nice. But of course, they don't grow where I live, and certainly not this time of year. So I have to import it, which means we've developed these commerce systems that allow us to like buy and exchange goods around the globe. And we put those things on boats to go back and forth. And then, you know, we're clear cutting a forest somewhere in Brazil to grow all these like plantations with bananas and things. And so, so yes, we have the same banana craving as in any as any of our ancestors, but we have all this crazy infrastructure that we built to support the banana craving. And so the craving is the same. The solution is terrible. And that is that is a problem for us because the solutions for make, growing bananas are going to maybe make us go extinct. Global warming, it's bad. Um, and so that is the trouble. We still behave as if everything is important in the here and now, but the things we're doing impact the future. There wasn't much mention of animals in this chapter, Justin. Uh, the exception to that, I guess, are has to do with Brazilian termites. Why are Brazilian termites so much more efficient at using land than humans? Yeah, I think I brought them up to show that um, because like the the land transformation for bananas, for example, you don't have a lot of examples of animals transforming the land in such a fundamental way that is bad because those termites have been making these mounds uh their you know their their homes under the ground for you know thousands and thousands of years and it's really changed the structure of the earth i mean you can see those those network of mounds from space like it's an enormous mound area so that's a, an example of an animal similar to a human transforming the earth but when they transform it like that it's through sort of slowly through natural processes and they create a lot of um good vegetation space like new species move in so it's created a nice happy world that's not destructive whereas humans when we transform land uh, often transform it in such a ways that it's just an ecological wasteland um and so yeah humans because we're smart and we can do such amazing things and we have mechanized farming we can transfer things in ways that animals can't and sometimes it's good but it's usually not <laughs> hmm. chapter seven is human exceptionalism why are bed bugs a good counter to the idea of human exceptionalism i love the bed bug story my editor did not love the bed bug stories like no one wants to hear about bed bugs but i i think they're fantastic they're a great foil to human intelligence because <laughs> we've been fighting bed bugs because these bed bugs live off of human blood they're specialized in human blood now they've been that way for a long time uh, and we haven't been able to get rid of them. And at some point, we almost did in North America because we sprayed every house with DDT. That was our solution for getting rid of bed bugs. And it's a good solution, right? Because we almost got them all, but we didn't get all of them. Some of them survived, and now they're all over our hotels and our bedrooms today. We're still fighting them, uh, and, and we're not able to beat them. And they're small insects. They don't do a lot of complicated things cognitively, but they're so good at what they do. They can hide in the in the bed stand right next to you you'll never know that they're there and they're feeding off your blood all night and as smart as we both are we're not going to be able to defeat bed bugs i've been chased out of an apartment that i lived in that was infested with bed bugs and the only solution was to leave so i've personally lost the battle of wits to bed bugs so i love them as an example their behavior is relatively simple but they're better than humans at this battle and the kicker is that ddt that we sprayed uh as a solution um Turns out DDT is not really all that good for you. And it's been accumulating in our bodies. And so like you and I both have it in our in our bodies right now from when people sprayed 100 years ago. Uh, and it's now we're starting to realize 
even though you know it's toxic, but we didn't quite realize it's responsible for a lot of problems, weight gain, obesity, and then cancer. So all this bed bug fighting that we did, we've lost the war and we're killing ourselves. And so that's just a perfect example of how humans screw stuff up by being smart. Boy, we could do a podcast on its own of all the uh, the environmental pollutants that have found their way into humans that are just wrecking our collective health right now. We won't do that, though, but I will <laughs> ask you about uh, the sea squirt. What do you envy about the life of the sea squirt? I love the, the sea squirt. So you always think of evolution as like we're moving forward toward more complexity, toward more intelligence. But uh, evolution does not care or work that way. It just comes up with the best solution. And in the case of the sea squirt, uh, when they're born, they've got a little little brainy thing, and it's like a spinal column, and they swim through the water. And then when they find a place where they want to spend the rest of their lives, they cement themselves onto that substrate, and then they digest their brain. Uh, and, and so that they don't need to think and move around very much anymore. They're just sort of flowing and filter feeding. So that's evolution saying, like, look, thinking is bad for sea squirts. We're going to get rid of this ability. We don't, they don't need to do it anymore, and that's, they'll live a better life because of it. And so that just shows you that evolution does not care about human intelligence. It's not moving toward it. And in fact, uh, it will get rid of intelligence if it's a problem. And that's the question, is that what nature is doing to us now? Because we seem to be on a path towards self-extinction because maybe, maybe evolution is sick of our intelligence and about to get rid of it. So speaking of, what do you think the true value is of human intelligence then, Justin? Um. In my personal life, I love all this consciousness that I have and the ability to make art and enjoy music and go you know, watch movies. It's great. I'm enjoying it. Uh, so the value of human intelligence is that for the individuals, for us, we live fun, interesting, exciting lives doing all these smart, talky, thinky things. So that's the value of it. Um, and I'm fine with it. We, we, we have the ability to uh, think about the world and think about a better world and make the world better. Make, you know, invent medicine, like be nice to your friends, help them out when they're ill or injured. And that's cool. So that's the value. And are you optimistic or pessimistic about our future and why? I mean, in the book, I certainly come off as very pessimistic. And I think in real life, I'm probably pretty pessimistic about it. Uh, just because looking at the news reports as it relates to the, the, the existential threats, nuclear war, obviously, but then climate change and our complete ability to really be taking meaningful action, it just seems as if we are uh, um, bad at fixing the problems we know about, which is weird because we're smart enough to know the problems and we've already got the solutions, but we're not implementing them very well. So we're sort of fighting our own psychology. And um, I just wonder if if that really is going to be a threat to civilization to the point where we extinct ourselves. So I'm optimistic because we know the solutions and we know how quickly globally humans can work toward a solution. So yes, someday we will, we will do the right thing. It's just, will we do it in time? I don't know. And final question. This is the most important question. If you could be any non-human animal, what would you be and why? Well, that's interesting. If I could be any non-human animal, I mean, I like to fly. Maybe I'd be a crow, I think. <laughs> I think definitely crow, because they, they do a lot of human-like, smart, silly, fun things. They, they're out there playing around. They look like they're having a good time, uh, and they can fly, which is fun. So I'm going to go with crow. No one's ever asked me that, but that's definitely my answer. <laughs> that's interesting that you didn't go with dolphins, that you specialize in dolphins. How far down the list does a dolphin fall if you were to have to, to rank the creatures that you would want to be? Well, the problem is I'm sick of swimming at this point and the ocean is cold. <laughs> and so I'm just, I'd rather be on land. <laughs> so no dolphins. Uh, that's a great answer. He is Justin Gregg. The new book is If Nietzsche Were a Narwhal, What Animal Intelligence Reveals About Human Stupidity. Justin, thank you so much for the time today. And thank you for this wonderfully informative and entertaining book. Thanks, Trey. It was a pleasure talking with you. Thanks to Gentleman Jesus for the intro and outro music. Hear more of his work at GentlemanJesus.com. And thanks to Joshua Bates for the video editing. If you have any video editing needs, hit him up on Instagram at Forager Digital. And thanks as always to you for checking us out. You can watch, listen, learn, and connect for free at BooksOnPod.com. For Books on Pod, I'm Trey Elling. Good day.